go. Speed the stars of thought on to their shining goals. The sower scatters broad his seed. The wheat thou strewst be souls. What's up, guys? We are back after what feels like a year of not recording any of these. This is Tiger back with Lobo. We're going back through the works of Ralph Waldo Emerson, the American great. Today we are going to go and we're hitting on a smaller essay today, but one that is still insanely powerful. That is intellect. Um, I actually found this one when it fell out of my, I got an old Emerson book and these pages fell out. So I was like, that is God telling me to read this one. And what I uncovered was one, a very thought provoking essay. And it's a very, um, I would say this, this essay has a lot of verticality compared to, or, you know, obviously Emerson's very far reaching, but verticality in the sense that he touches deep into the soil while also reaching very high up in the heavens, you know, in traditional Emersonian format. But it's like the, the, um, sort of how, how it flows is just very, it's very beautiful and how he, how he constantly touches the lowest of the lows and the highest of the highs in this one. And, um, once again, it's one of those things that you read it and it just rings true. So Lobo, what do you feel about this one? You feel the same? This one's really cool. Uh, I actually want to read it more times. I've read it about four times, but I want to read it more because to me, it explains something that has always been a gift of mine that I couldn't explain myself, which is interesting because he talks about that happening to people in this essay where someone else explained something that you already knew, but you couldn't explain. And it's highlighted something that I've been good at. And because I didn't know what that was or where it came from, now I know what it is. I know how to use it better. And I'm gonna know how to harness that ability. And we'll get into what that ability is later as we get into the podcast. But yeah, this one's, this one's great. And it's something that I think can be read time and time again, and you get new insights as per with Emerson. Seems like every time I read something, my highlights increase. So yeah, I'm excited to be back. It's been a while. And yeah, intellect, let's do this. So I guess I'll start and I basically have the whole first paragraph highlighted and goes like this. Every substance is negatively electric to that which stands above it in the chemical tables, positively to that which stands below it. Water dissolves wood and iron and salt. Air dissolves water. Electric fire dissolves air. But the intellect dissolves fire, gravity, laws, method, and the subtlest unnamed relations of nature in its resistless minstrum. So this is really cool to me. What it really made me think about is that the mind and intellect is above all. None of the things we have, none of the things we observe has character without the observer. So all these things, fire, gravity, laws, they all take us being here to give them character and to dissolve them and to define them and explain them and to discover their secrets. So I like that he starts with that, that the, the intellect is really above everything. Yeah, it's we're all of, uh, you know, it's the, it's the core of man's potential to, to change behavior and to test things and to, to just do things in the world. You know, the minds of, think of all the great advances. You know, this is something, actually, I just thought of this right now. So I think we, we actually touched on this. Uh, in one of his one of his earlier ones, but like for example, America's national parks are world renowned and they're like the greatest part of this country. But they wouldn't have been they wouldn't they wouldn't be habitable or even like tre trekkable for for most people if a guy didn't have in his mind a vision to to make trails in them and to clear out brush and to and to make you know to put picnic benches there and to make areas where you can camp. That all started in a, in a man's mind, so. The mind can uh, can literally terraform reality. Yeah, I like to call that God makes, but man shapes. Oh, that's great. 
Virgo. Like God made the world around us, but we shape the world around us at the same yes. time. That's, so that's, that's great. Ex- that's exactly what that is. All right, back to Emerson. So he says, the first questions are always to be asked and the wisest doctor is graveled by the inquisitiveness of a child. He goes on to say, its vision is not like the vision of the eye, but is a union with things, with the things known. So what this made me think about was omniscience. Like he's kind of saying that the mind has some sort of omniscience to it, which is all knowingness. Yeah, and you know, the line, first questions are always to be asked, and the the wisest doctor is graveled by the inquisitiveness of the child. For Emerson, you know, he was this is the mid eighteen hundreds, everyone. So so graveled in this case means confused or to to befuddle, right? So the wisest doctor, the man with all this experience, is befuddled by the pure mind of the child, the pure way of thinking of a child. Yeah, in many ways, children are the most intelligent. Yes. I think we've mentioned this on another podcast. What what I like about Emerson, too, is all his works connect, mm-hmm. right? So there's many things I'll read in his essays that remind me of another essay. And it just creates this positive feedback loop of, like, enlightenment and illumination. It does. But it, this every time I talk about the intellect of children, it always brings me back to one of my favorite Jim Rohn quotes, which you may have heard me quote before, but Jim Rohn has a quote where he says, how many languages can a child learn? And he says, as many as you're willing to teach them. Their capacity for learning is higher than ours. And because their minds aren't so cluttered with all the different things that get thrown at us throughout our life, they're able to look at everything simply. And because the world is complex, complex problems have simple solutions. So children are able to live in the simplistic state that allows them to deconstruct all the complex things around them very easily. Yeah, they really, you know, the children really only lack the crystallized intelligence, you know, like they lack the, the encyclopedia aspect of knowledge, but the, the questioning angle and the purity of the mind before it gets psyoped by, you know, all of modern life and stuff like that, that's there. And that is, it's cutting. I mean, I know so many people who, you know, they have kids and their kid, their kid just asks them a super innocent, simple question. And they just like, they take that to heart and it just break like, the kid asks why they're doing something and it just breaks them. And they're like, yeah, I should not be doing this right now. And like all, all that happens. So yeah, it's just like, yeah, it's like, like you get this perfect high speed mind that has no limits. And then you just put all these governors on it throughout life and you think you're educating it, but you're really stifling it in some way. So that's going to be moving forward in my life. That's something I'm excited about, about having kids is, trying to figure out ways that, well, it's going to give me a up close and personal experience of this simplistic inquisitive mind. And it's going to be fun playing with different ways to either spark their thoughts, you know, and see what my inputs do to their outputs, you know? Yeah. I also think too it it'll be it'll be good to see you know what just like what what is a like what is a pure perspective on this thing that I've maybe taken for granted you know taken like I I, I was listening to uh Owen Benjamin had this guy on yesterday and they were talking about like having their kids and whatnot and like how the one guy's daughter just like loves to see the moon whenever it's out it's like the biggest event in the world and like they have to go outside and stare at the stars and it's just like amazing and he was like. Yeah, it's insane that there's these lights above the sky that twinkle and dance for us every single night, and we just, like, don't care about them. Like, that's mental. We actually talked about this in nature. Yeah, I he think has so. an exact quote about this, something along, along the lines of, like, 
men don't even realize that there's just like dancing heavens above them. Like he's like, if the stars only came out one night in a thousand years, how men would like ooh and ah at the spectacle of the gods. I know. We just take it for granted. We take everything for fucking granted, man. It's 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 kind of sad in a way, but because we know that we take it for granted, that means we have the opportunity to not take it for granted. Exactly. Exactly. You can always change. All right, here's a here's a quote that I like. He says, the intellect always ponders. Nature shows all things formed and bound. The internet, the intellect pierces the form, overleaps the wall, detects intrinsic likeness between remote things, and reduces all things into a few principles. This actually made me think of something I read in the Kabbalion, the seven hermetic principles. Like, even though we live in this world, like I said, everything, complexity and simplicity are intertwined. So even though we have all these information and all these incredible things, we can reduce all of this to principles, right? And the seven hermetic principles, the first one's mentality. And the first one is actually what Emerson is talking about. Mentality means that all is mind and the universe is mental. That's the first of the hermetic principles. The second is correspondence. People know this one as above, so below. Then there's vibration. Nothing rests. Everything moves. Everything vibrates. Then there's polarity. Everything is dual. Everything has poles. Everything has a pair of opposites. Like and unlike are the same. Opposites are identical in nature, but different in degrees extremes meet. All truths are half-truths. All paradoxes may be reconciled. Hmm. Then you have the law of gender. And that's always saying that gender is in everything. Everything has its masculine and feminine principles. Gender manifests on all planes. Then you have rhythm. Everything flows in and out. Everything has a tide. Everything has a rise and fall. The pendulum swing manifests in everything. The measure of the swing on the right is the measure of the swing on the left. Right, And then the last one is cause and effect, or it's every cause has its effect, and every effect has its cause, and everything that happens according to this law. So where he's talking about nature shows all things formed and bound, right? The world around us is already formed and bound. The intellect pierces the form and overleases the wall and detects, intrinsic, and detects the intrinsic likeness between remote things, because in all things are these seven principles, Mm-hmm. And, it, and it says, and it reduces it into a few principles. And it just made me think of the hermetic principles that I learned many years ago. And that's exactly what it is. It's like he has, an, it's basically like Musashi talks about, about seeing the way in all things. He has another excerpt, excerpt in this essay, basically saying the same thing. But it's just incredible that even though the world around us is wondrous, we can reduce everything and measure it in simple principles it's really like detecting likeness first of all that you can sit there for the rest of your life and just ponder those seven hermetic principles those are those are insane like those are so (laughs) far reaching in every corner of your life and there's they interact all in different ways you could just spend seven years 700 years seven thousand years you know just reading those um uh, yeah, the angle of detecting intrinsic likeness between remote things. Yeah, that you know, semiotics. That's that's a that's a form of that's a human imagination right there. Being able to reduce things, being able to pierce through things, being able to um, identify the, the you know the forms as Plato would call them. Right, being able to identify those forms is it's a deeply human human experience, and it's only something that you know a sharpened intellect can do i'd like to go back to the top of the paragraph because he he explains he kind of gives like a definition for what intellect is intellect and intellection signify to the common ear consideration of abstract truth so it's you're basically um you're extract like the intellect is the ability to extract principles it's the ability to abstract truths it's the ability to use your mind and think of scenarios 
you know, you know, in the in the past and in the future, and you know, and to to predict the present, it's uh, it's in the realm of the imagination. It's where it exists, and this is again a deeply human thing that um, that only we have. Yes, I also like how he says intellect separates the fact considered from you from all local and personal reference and discerns it as if it existed for its own sake. Yes. Because I, I like that because it makes it exist for its own sake, but at the same time, it only exists because we're observing it. Right. It's like the whole of the universe ceased to exist after I die because I'm no longer experiencing it. Yeah, the ability to to remove and to change contexts is is very powerful, and it's again something that only we can do. And I'd like definition because um, intellect to me is not cognition. You know, lots of animals have cognition. Lots of animals can can think and you know fight or flight and whatever. That's not the intellect is a is a human experience. It's the mind. It's the, it's the uh, you know the mind, body, and soul, right? Or the mind, the mind, soul, and spirit. It's this triage. It's part of. The, it's a very important part of, of the human experience. Right. It's like, you take something that has its own type of cognition and intelligence, like an ant. In many ways, they're they're hyper intelligent and and can communicate and interact in ways that we don't understand. But we understand what an ant is when we see it. But when we walk by an ant, it can have no concept of a human. Yes. Right? Back to Emerson. Every man beholds his condition with a degree of melancholy. I sure do. As a ship aground is battered by the waves, so man, imprisoned in his mortal life, lies open to the mercy of coming events. But a truth separated by the intellect is no longer a subject of destiny. We behold it as a God upraised above care and fear. And so any fact in our life or any record of our fancies or reflections disentangled from the web of our unconsciousness becomes an object impersonal and immortal. It is the past restored but embalmed and better art than that of Egypt has taken fear and corruption out of it. It is eviscerated of care. So what this reminds me of is when they say men fear what they don't understand. And intellect is like a light. Understanding is like a light. And what light does is it removes the fear of darkness. We're less afraid when we can see more. Right? So he's talking about how we're tortured by this condition of not knowing. And what the intellect does is it allows you to get the ability to know, and then the thing doesn't have to torture you so much once you can understand what it is. Yeah, and, and it's that's like light. that's enlightenment. It's removing the, the darkness because that's where fear is. It's in the dark. It's very powerful too. It's very powerful. I like you said too, but a truth separated by the intellect is no longer a subject of destiny, right? It can it behold it as a God appraised above care and fear, right? It, ju it just is. It just is. The That's truth powerful. gives us some sort of control over things. Yeah, well, it gives us a, uh, yeah, it gives us a like point. Better, that that moving. better a harsh truth than like a uh, comforting lie. Yes, yes. Yes, it's better to, um, yeah. Even if it's bad, we know kind of we we, we know our orientation in our X, in the X Y Z space of reality when there's a when we know there's a hard truth there, you know. It doesn't matter if it makes us feel good or bad. When we know that there, okay, we know that there's maybe a boundary there, or there's a point that we can kind of circle around, but we can't pretend it's not there. He says, "What is addressed to us for contemplation does not threaten us." What makes us intellectual beings. Mm. I like that. This made me think of just enlightenment to just bring forth clarity. Yes, through and contemplation. Takes I would say. I would say lots of modern, lots of modern man, lots of us are 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 actually terrified of contemplation. Think of all the people who, you know, they you know maybe they live in a high crime area or something like that, and they think like, am I voting this in? 
or whatever, or you know, that even something on a really small scale too. If it's if it's a you, you know, that's how trauma cycles continue is something keeps happening that keeps screwing up your life, but you don't want to contemplate it and and take you know take it like an abstract thing and really work on it and ground it in truth. You want to just hide it and you want to you want you want to you know like like that ship example from above. <laughs> you want to lie open to the mercy of the coming events and then complain. Contemplation is facing things. Yes. That's that's all it is. It's facing things head up. I like that angle. Yeah, it is. It's tackling with on the intellectual level. The growth of the intellect is spontaneous in every expansion. The mind that grows could not predict the times, the means, the mode of that spontaneity. God enters by a private door into every individual. This is one of my favorite parts of the entire essay because it explains something that I don't have an explanation for, or I didn't have an explanation for. I wrote a tweet recently where I was like, I don't know how I know certain things. God just be airdropping information into my brain. That's what he's talking about here. He's talking about what I call airdrops, where he's like, the growth of the intellect is spontaneous. He's like, the mind that grows, you can't predict the time that it comes, the means that it comes, or the mode of that spontaneity. God just enters through a private door into every individual. Yep. That's that's exactly what I experience. I just experience these airdrops sometimes where it's like my intellect and understanding just grows out of nowhere. Something clicks. It's a light switch gets flipped on, right? That's what it is. It's that experience re when you're reading a book and there's that one sentence and you just keep rereading it because it's it's like it fits a it's a perfect puzzle piece from a problem that you've been experiencing or an, or an idea that you've been wrangling with. And it just happened. You just happened to pick up that book. You just happened to read that page one day. You could have never predicted that. Nothing could have happened. It just happened. Or you could have read it before and then you read it True. another day and it just looks completely different. What What is the image that we know of of having it as an idea? Like what is the picture of it? A light bulb. A light bulb going off. It just turns on out of nowhere. Yeah. And that's one of the best uh, visual metaphors for anything, honestly. It might be the visual metaphor. And he literally says, uh, out of darkness, it came insensibly into the marvelous light of today. Like, it's, it's all this is about. It's illumination. And it's spontaneous. You don't always know when, why, or how it's going to come. But there are ways to make it come to you easier and I, he does get into that later for sure yeah i mean that's what's like yeah the people who read lots of books they end up with these you know they have they have more of these moments in general just because they're putting in more of the reps you know if you're if you're just scrolling twitter all day you're not gonna you, this isn't gonna happen to you well you'll get more light bulbs turned on by reading the same thing multiple times than you will by reading various things once yeah just like you'll get more light bulbs turned on by reading Emerson. I've learned more than I knew reading it this time than the last time I read it. Exactly. Already, just by going through it again. Back to Emerson. In the most worn, pedantic, introverted, self-tormentor's life. I think he's talking about me. <laughs> the greatest part is incalculable by him unforeseen, unimaginable, and must be until he can take himself up by his own ears. What am I? What has my will done to make me what I am? Nothing. I have been floated into this thought, this hour, this connection of events by secret currents of might and mind, and my ingenuity and willfulness have not thwarted, have not aided to an appreciable degree. What this reminds me of is how we're really just a product of our environment and our experiences. We're a product of all the information that we have collected and consumed throughout our lives. That's why he says, what am I? What has my will done to make me what I am? Nothing. I've been floated into this thought, this hour, this connection of events by secret currents of might and mind. 
and my ingenuity and willfulness have not thwarted. That that's what he's talking about to me. He's talking about how you came to this state, you're taking in information from your experiences, from your environment, from your interactions, unbeknownst to you. And they all bring you to this collective point of where you are now. I think the, um, (laughs) I like the part about will. I like, what is my will done to make me that I am? Nothing, right? There's all this talk about, oh, you gotta get a willpower and get it done, blah, blah, blah. To me, you know, every time I've tried to force something like that or like, you you know, go really hard and to try to try to get something to happen. Sometimes it happens, but a lot of the time you, you, you just waste your energy or if it does happen, it happens way harder and way more strenuously than it should have. But the best the best experiences are, you you know, a thought just comes to you. You're on a walk and something just comes to you, something you read two weeks ago finally clicks it's just these ran you know it's just just because you you were programmed by your environment it's just this random current like he says secret currents of might and mind and it's just it's something you have to bash yourself into and you have to um i mean this you know you hear this a lot but you do have to let go in a sense of trying to grasp a meeting instantly from something you know like sometimes you just don't get that meaning right now, but you will in maybe a week or maybe two years or maybe a decade. You, it'll you'll it'll finally click. So, you know, it's it's not like a uh, it's not like a speed run. It's not like a video game here. We are we're 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 at the mercy of God with what information and what uh what will spark our intellect at, at a certain time. And to go back to what you said about like oh just willpower your way through it. It's like your willpower was built by something or destroyed by something throughout your life your will starts being built when you're a child Mm -hmm. like your parents help you form that you know so like even when you're talking about using these things that are supposed to be intrinsic like the ability that you have has been built by experiences that you may not even remember or understand I get what people talk about when they talk about like childhood trauma. I don't like that word trauma or whatever, but there's so many things that form you from the moment you come into this world that you don't even understand. You can be formed by something as simple as as soon as you came out of your mother's body, you get heavy metals and toxins injected into you. Mm -hmm. That changes who you are because you're a baby and you're coming into an environment for the first time after being in a completely nurturing and safe, warm environment into this cold room with fluorescent lights. And then you're being injected and feeling pain like that has some sort of effect on your psyche at some point. Right. Or like when people sleep with their, they put their babies in another room. Like of course a kid's going to freak out. Like a a, a baby is going to freak out in the middle of the night because they're not used to never not having contact with another human being, feeling that heartbeat next to them, right? And it's like even little simple things like that from the time you're a child can affect your your courage or your will. Agreed. So I'm pointing all these things out to say, it's like imagine how many other little simple events like that that are, are seemingly insignificant form the character of who you are throughout your life. I agree. I agree. Yeah. It's, 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 you know, it's, it's cliche, but the butterfly effect is real, you know, like a tiny little thing can have massive effects years down the line. Yeah. You can't even, you, can't even cons- you know, the 20th order effects of something, right. You can't even conceive of those. Right. You don't one one conversation can change your entire life. One experience, one rejection, one loss, one success. They can change everything that you are. And then you're brought and, and it's because when he says they're secret currents, I feel like they're secret because we're unaware of all of them. Right? We the ones we're aware of, we we deconstruct and we try to make something out of it. Um he's actually gonna talk about something later on that I I have a way myself of trying to connect to these past events 
and deconstruct and learn something from them. But we'll get to that later in the essay. Let's read this part. Our spontaneous action is always the best. You cannot, with your best deliberation and heed, come so close to any question as your spontaneous glance shall bring you, whilst you rise from your bed or walk abroad in the morning after meditating the matter before sleep on the previous night. So. Exactly. <laughs> you, you, you can contemplate things all you want, but sometimes your gut and your instinct are the brightest light that can shine. And what he talks about here is really key because I've noticed this in my life, and this is something that I suggest to people. He says, whilst you rise from your bed or walk abroad in the morning after meditating the matter before sleep on the previous night, one of the best ways to get answers for the questions in your life is to ask them to yourself before you go to sleep because you're sending the question into your subconscious to try to answer it. And I did this a lot where it's like things that are of great confusion i ponder them at the end of the night before i go to sleep and mm. i let my unconscious mind take over you know questions are the answers the more questions you ask yourself the more answers you're going to have and there's a good time to ask yourself questions that's what the end of the night is for it's for reflection just like i wrote a really cool post in my telegram once about how the hours of the day are perfectly aligned with the seasons yes remember and this. like the end hours of the night are winter what is winter for it's a time for reflection and thinking and planning right and then you right. have new ideas on what to do in the spring this is how humanity progressed right having these breaks months at a time where you're stuck indoors and you have nothing to do but contemplate yeah how i can make my spring planting better to make my harvest better and how can, can i work can, better can, in the can summer? you think of that too like imagine for three months or whatever all you can do is sit inside and plan like imagine how much pent-up energy you have when the first flower blooms on spring to go out and just implement all your plans and to go crush crush the, the fields and whatnot right exactly and now imagine that you have a winter every night mm. and you have a spring every morning that's powerful that's a great so, reframe i'm gonna try that tonight yeah so the end of the days are for reflection even some of the greatest minds of all time that's what they did at the end of every day sat there and reflected and i actually think before the internet most of us did this naturally when I was a child, all I used to do at the end of every night was replay my entire day and think about the day ahead. And I would plan for it. Mostly it was just like how I'm going to talk to this girl at school tomorrow. But like, <laughs> I or like running through like, oh, she, um, she chose to hug me and kiss, hug, torture. You ever play that game? No. All right, kiss, hug, torture time. is like a, a chasing game where you run around there's boys and girls playing it. You're on the playground. You run around and you try to catch someone. So most of the guys are trying to catch a girl. And then when you grab them, you say, kiss, cuddle, or torture, right? And if they say kiss, you get to kiss them. If they say cuddle, you give them a hug. If they say torture, you get to punch them. So like, <laughs> we would play this game and it was a big deal if you caught a girl and she only hugged you or it was a big deal. And the person that gets caught, they're it next. So you can kind of tell like who that girl likes because she's going to chase after a boy, but usually they chase after their friends. So, but this is the type of stuff I used to think about as a little kid. I was like, oh, and I caught her, she hugged me. Or when she got caught and she was it, she didn't chase after me, you know, <laughs> like little yeah. things like that. But um, anyways, I digress. But what he also says is he talks about walking. Right. He's like, when you walk abroad in the morning, this is how I get most of my airdrops. I get most of my airdrops when I'm walking, walking yeah. or exercising. That's when my most profound insights and thoughts come to me. And it's interesting that he mentions walking because his buddy Thoreau actually wrote a book called Walking. And maybe we'll go over that one day as like a special episode. Yeah, but we should. It's just all about the art of sauntering and how the skill and benefits of walking are lost to us 
and one thing one thing i just like i love this framing of you 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 meditate it's like perfect relaxation and focus and then just perfect spontaneous uh opening of of thoughts right because you have this meditation right before you go to sleep but then when the day breaks you're immediately moving the body it's like a total reversal it's that polarity right there i think that right there that speaks to a deep truth yeah that that's very insightful i have to think about that one for a little bit it's like when the sun comes out your you know your first urge should be to you know in a healthy human it's when the sun the sun rises you get out and you're you're ready to start your day and you should get moving your circadian rhythm's all on point and so getting up and like just walking straight to your computer just like starting sending emails or whatever right like you know you're already you don't have a you don't have any chance to process the subconscious um the subconscious stuff that that came out throughout the night yeah you're going from static to static you need to go from static to motion yeah he says we do not determine what we will think we only open our senses clear away as we can all obstruction from the fact and suffer the intellect to see this is basically a continuation of what he was saying right it's like this is why i say like i like pondering things at night because that's when i can open my senses clear things away and all obstruction from the fact disappears and i allow the intellect to see yes I love that little friend. I love that little sentence. We are the prisoners of ideas. I think that is, that's great. Yes. Um, yeah, we are prisoners of ideas and even um, good ideas. Oh, well, I mean, yeah. you know, some are prisoners. Some become outright slaves to ideas, you know, great, good and bad people, right? Like someone like Steve Jobs, obsessed with the idea of perfection and, and, art, and adding artistry into products, right? Like, there's all this, there's people, ideas, just things inside the mind can absolutely just take over somebody, which is that alone is, is something it's like one of those, true, like, like we're talking about the stars, right? The fact that something inside the mind that doesn't exist in reality can make a guy go make $10 million or go run like 200 miles or whatever. Just the mind is mental. Like that's crazy. Or it can destroy you completely. Yeah. It can go both ways. And he actually touches on this later. And I, I have more to expound on this point, but he touches on this later. And I'll make my point in regards to this. We are prisoners of ideas. But like it says, we have little control over our thoughts. We are the prisoners of ideas. They catch us up for moments into their heaven and so fully engage us that we take no thought for the morrow. Gaze like children without an effort to make them our own. By and by, we fall out of that rapture. We think us where we have been, what we have seen, and repeat as truly as we can what we have beheld. As far as we can recall these ecstasies, we carry away in the ine ineffable memory that result, and all men in all ages confirm it. It is called truth. But the moments we cease the moment we cease to report and attempt to correct and contrive, it is not truth. That's pretty interesting. It's like it's called truth, but the moment we cease to report and attempt to correct and contrive, it's no longer truth. Yeah, yeah. The moment we're like, yeah, the moment we try to edit, edit, you know, edit what's 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 been given to us. God's like, here's a gift, and we're like, no, we don't like it. It's like, all right, it's not real anymore. Then, yeah, you start dissecting it. You know, sometimes yeah. you don't need to. You you change the very nature of it by your interaction with it. Yeah, it's it's almost like this cycle is. It's not finding the way to become like the best thinker in a sense. It's almost like being being the best vessel, because if you're taking spontaneous action and you're quickly acting and, and working upon and contemplating on the thoughts that pop in your mind, versus trying to diagnose them all and and look at them through like a, a more like fearful or you know corrective quote unquote lens, then you're not going to get anywhere. Here he says, if we consider what persons have stimulated and profited us, so which people have sparked our mind or added value to us, we shall perceive the superiority of the spontaneous or intuitive principle over the arithmetical or logical. The first that contains the second, but virtual and latent. 
So when you think about people who have changed you in some way, like by saying something that is profound to you or something that, like we said, turns the light bulb on, that's when you are also experiences, experiencing the spontaneous growth of the mind that he's talking about, the intuition taking over that he's talking about. And you see that this way of learning is superior to trying to have just a purely logical, mathematical view of everything. In every man's mind, some images, words, and facts remain without effort on his part to imprint them, which others forget, and afterwards these illustrate to him important laws. So what he's saying here is some things stay without your will. It's like once you see some things, you can't unsee them. Mm -hmm. Without effort, those images, those words, and those facts remain. And they imprint on you something which others forget sometimes. Like, once I saw early life, I couldn't unsee it. Right? <laughs> like, it's like that. Yes. Some things, once you notice them, it just clicks and you can never unsee it. Uh, a good example would be like Gota. Yes. That's a, I, that's a great example. Once I started noting people's, pe noticing people's gates and the way they walk and their foot position, where they pronate you know whether they externally rotate i couldn't unsee it now i see the way that every man walks yeah. and it's something another, that it's incredible because i it's not like i had never seen anybody walk before yeah but now, but now it's a completely different now walking is a completely study. different thing to me now it's in yeah. running. now i see it in lifting mm -hmm. i see it everywhere and i can't unsee it and anybody that learns it has the same effect they can't unsee it it's and there there are many things like this in life you know, just I, I, like I, I, when you see, like, like his, in, yeah, just like you when you see like the inversion and in like propaganda. Like once you become keen to it, it's not something that can ever leave you. Once the light is on, that's it. Yes, yes, exactly. It doesn't turn off. The light clears the darkness, right? It's God's light. It doesn't need a electricity source. It just is. Right. The sun rises on some things and some and never sets. You have first an instinct, then an opinion, then a knowledge. And I love that that progression, right? Where it's like, and I mean, to, to me, well, another great example of that is, is like a physiognomy, right? And obviously, a lot of people do physiognomy totally wrong, and they just like don't like somebody. And so they're like, oh, he has bad physiognomy. But, you know, when you know, you notice trends in how people look and then how, how their behaviors map to that. And then you start building this, this sort of matrix in your mind of this. It's hilarious. Yeah, it can't go away. And I like how he says, first, first you have instinct and opinion and knowledge as the plant has root, bud, and then fruit. It's all natural. I love that. It's all natural for us. Trust the instinct to the end though you can render no reason. Yep. It is vain to hurry it. By trusting it to the end, it shall ripen into truth, and you shall know why you believe. That's so powerful. Because I think I think one problem that, like, rationalists have is that they want to, you know, they want the, the reason first. But, you know, sometimes your instinct, your initial, you know, you see something there, and the outcome of that, when you reach the knowledge stage, it's different than what your instinct was saying, but it was still something very interesting and something that was essential to add to your, you know, like your mental arsenal in a sense. Like you might have an instinct on somebody that is one thing, but you might end up with, with a completely different sort of en route, uh, uh, en route with it. But a rationalist would say, oh, there's no reason to follow that from the very beginning. And that's just, you know, so many people are just, are snip, uh, go back to the plant example. They're snipping their roots before they become buds. They're just, they're just derooting their plants and leaving an empty mess of dirt and weeds in their mind. Well, it's kind of the whole awakening process, right? Like you start at the root. Where are you, where are you at? You're in the ground. There's no light. There's darkness. Mm -hmm. And then you mm -hmm. start to rise up above the darkness and break through the soil right mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. And then it turns into the fruit. The fruit is when you know why you believe that thing. This is like the whole kind of, it's kind of like the whole red pill process. Like people just feel something isn't right. Well, that's your instinct telling you. You don't know why it isn't right. You can't explain why it isn't right. But you have this instinct that just tells you, man, maybe things aren't the way they seem or the way they're portrayed in like mass media or Hollywood. Maybe something's wrong with this. Some, you have yeah. this intrinsic feeling and you don't know what it is or why you feel that way. But if you trust it and you follow it and you go down that rabbit hole, in the end, you'll know why you believe that and it'll all make sense. So what really is important is to learn how to realize that that instinct, that gut feeling is trying to tell you something. It's trying to get you to rise out of the dark soil and into the sunlight, right? Exactly. And then when you do that, it'll start to bear fruit. And the fruit is the explanation, the whys, the hows, the who, what's, the where's, the when's. And then those are, that fruit doesn't go away, right? It's something that you consume, which becomes what a part of you. Okay. Lobo is just out here explaining Genesis. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kind of spitting, not gonna lie. But I love I love this essay. I'm having fun. All right. Each mind has its own method. A true man never acquires after college rules. What you have aggregated in a natural manner surprises and delights when it is produced. For we cannot oversee each other's secret. And hence the differences between men and natural endowment are insignificant in comparison with their common wealth. Do you think the porter and the cook have no anecdotes, no experiences, no wonders for you? Everybody knows as much as the savant. To me, this was really, really profound. And I, obviously he goes with the basic, you know, college can't teach you what life is really about. Emerson is clear. literally just a red pill guru just about <laughs> yeah. 200 years before. I'm, I'm telling you, you don't need to read any of these new new guys. You just got to go back in the past. It's all there for you already. Before you spit, I just want to say, I think like, I don't know if, I don't know if he's being cheeky here or not, but he's like, hence the differences between men and natural endowment are insignificant compared with the commonwealth. Like, is he talking about dick here? No, he's like, not. He, okay, because I'm just uh, my my fucked up. He's talking mind is about that. he's talking about mental endowment, which I okay. guess you could say is a way to penetrate the world. But <laughs> um, because no, I, I, I just our, thought this was like some slick like some slick humor because sometimes sometimes little jokes like this get fit fit in so i was just curious i think he's too much of a gentleman okay (laughs) so yeah the natural endowment that he's talking about is your natural mental capacity he says that's insignificant in comparison with their common wealth and Mm -hmm. the common wealth is our method that's what he talks about the beginning each man has each mind has its own method and this method gives us access to the common wealth, which is information and intelligence, right? We all have access to it. It's like, that's why the the porter, the cook, they have anecdotes, they have experiences, and they have wonders for you. Yes. Everybody knows as much as a savant. It's like, there's wisdom in everything, every yes. person, every experience. You know, yes. a lot of the time, you learn something from everyone, even if 90% of the time these days, it's you, all you learn from is how you don't want to be. What's that expression? Talk talk to a man for 10 minutes and he'll tell you things that you couldn't possibly believe. Like, yeah, ex- exactly. Like, it's like, like we talk about in farming. A farmer knows the rules of life that the philosopher has to ponder. Yes. Yes, he just lives them out. He lives them out on an everyday basis. And it's like, this, this goes back to my favorite person to listen to, which is David Goggins. David Goggins is the most enlightened person that I've heard speak <laughs> in the past since I can remember. And I'm a, I know that sounds crazy. I know his content, content or whatever, his messages. That's all I like to say. I don't say content. I, we don't create it's communication. We, we send a message. It's communication, right? I know his message probably resonates with a lot of people as 
rah rah motivation, but it's because they can't see deep enough into it. Goggins comes to the same conclusions as the greatest philosophers of all time. He just does it through suffering. He does it. He's at the. It, he's. I don't think he's dumb, but it's like he's at the bottom of the bell curve, coming up with the same conclusions as the transcendent metaphysicians of the world. Yes. Right, and he's doing it through putting himself in the hardest positions that he could possibly put himself in so that all of life is stripped away to the bare truths and the bare reality of all things. And so he's one, that's why he's one of the, he's literally the only person I, I listen to now because he just gets it. And he's not cluttered with all the things we're cluttered. Like, did you see Trump's AI video post or anything like he's not cluttered with any of that shit or trans reading out. He's not thinking about any of that. He's just on the edge of life and death constantly reaching out into the void, the abyss and bringing back insights constantly. And when you are living that way, you rise above all the things on this material plane. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. He's like, he's he's constantly on that edge. He's on that edge where, um, he's on the edge where overthinking is the liability. Right. And so he needs to stop overthinking and becoming that he, he becomes the open vessel to where all this truth can just come in. Right. And here he says, every man in the degree in which he has wit and culture finds his curiosity inflamed concerning the modes of living and thinking of other men. Pause. And especially of those classes whose minds have not been subdued by the drill of school education. With this, <laughs> what this really made me think about was like, it's a shame how much people lack curiosity Uh uh-huh if you were more curious you would have more answers Mm -hmm. because you would ask more questions you should be fascinated by the experience of others even if it just teaches you how you don't want to be exactly yeah because anti-knowledge is real anti-knowledge is very helpful you know because it's good to have an idea i mean Peterson talked about this in a self-authoring program, right? Like it's really good to have an ideal. You need an ideal, but you also need hell. You also need exactly what not to do because sometimes you don't know the difference, you know? I really like this thought. Every man in the degree that he has wit and culture finds his curiosity inflamed by the modes and living and thinking of other men especially in those who haven't, he said, especially in those minds that have not been subdued by the drill of school education. So he's talking about the awakened minds, right? Those should fascinate you even more than just like the common man, I think. There's minds have not been subdued by the drill. There's nothing new under the sun, is there? No, there is He's talking about how school education, like back then, right? Somebody when school is way better than it is now. Like they're I, learning classical education, like Latin, Greek, Roman history. Dude, you like, get somebody, you you pull somebody out of school then, and you bring it today. People are going based, red pill, awesome. And then like Emerson's like, his mind has been subdued by school. <laughs> like, like it's, it's it's always been there, boys. It's always been that way. <laughs> what is the hardest task in the world to think? we all but apprehend we dimly forebode the truth we say i will walk abroad and the truth will take form and clearness to me we go forth but cannot find it it seems as if we need only the stillness composed attitude of the library to seize the thought but we come in and are as far from it as 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 at first then in a moment and unannounced the truth appears a certain wandering light appears and is the distinction, the principle that we wanted. But the oracle comes because we had previously laid siege to the shrine. So he's talking about, again, the spontaneity of these enlightenments, right? He's like, he's saying, if I go for a walk, the truth will take its form and clear me. But we go forth and it doesn't come. He's like, and then we go, oh, well, Maybe I need the the stillness and the composed attitude of the library. But we go to the library and we're just as far as it from it as we were before. 
And it's like then, in a moment unannounced, the truth appears. A certain light appears, and in the distinction, the principle that we wanted. He says, but the oracle comes because we had previously laid siege to the shrine. What he's saying is the answer comes because we asked the question. Right? I Someone wrote a really clever, I tweeted something about like questions or the answers a long time ago. Like I, I said most of the stuff, but someone had a really interesting comment where they said they like to think that answers are quantumly entangled with the question. I was, and, I was literally, Lobo, I was literally just thinking about that concept right now. <laughs> right? They're there together. And then the intellect is what untangles them. Mm-hmm. And then because they're separate, now you know the answer. That's that's profound. So now you must labor with your brains. And now you must forbear your activity and see what the great soul soweth. <laughs> Beggar. All right. Inspect what delights you in Plutarch, in Shakespeare, in Cervantes. I've never heard that name before. Spanish Each... author. He wrote uh, Don Quixote, one of my favorite books. Let's see what I would, I would, re- I would recommend you read uh, Don Quixote. It is, it's actually funny, and it. It's the conversations that the main characters have, some insanely high level truths are 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 delivered. Insanely high level. I'll have to check it out. I'm looking up the origin of the name Cervantes. Could mean servants or ladies men. All right. Each truth that a writer acquires is a lantern which he turns full on what facts and thoughts lay already in his mind. And behold, all the mats and rubbish would have littered his garret become precious. So each truth that a writer acquires is, is it's a lantern that he turns on. And he's like, but the, he turns it on the facts that were already in his mind. And behold, all of a sudden you can see it all. The facts were already there. He says, every trivial fact in his private biography becomes an illustration of this new principle, revisits the day and delights all men by its piquancy and new charm. Men say, where did he get this? And think there was something divine in his life. But no, they have myriads of facts just as good, would they only get a lamp to ransack their attics with all. Mm. Right? So it's like, He's talking about like Plutarch Shakespeare. It's like, man, where'd they get all these insights? It's like, no, they just turn the light on. On the same facts that you already have. Right? And it's just like, you just have to do that yourself. And you'll come into your own insights that will yep. seem phenomenal. And and he goes on later to talk about what this process is actually about. But we'll get to that part. But um. You must see the way in all things, you know, I, like my, one of my greatest skills in life is the ability to learn. I, I know the process of learning because I begin, I be, I've been a beginner many times mm-hmm. and the more times you're a beginner, it doesn't matter what the field is. The more times you start that process of going from beginner to novice to advanced to expert the easier it is to learn new things because you start to see the way of learning in all things. It's like there's even a book about it called The Art of Learning, Josh Whiteskin or something, where he just goes and gets really good at jiu-jitsu really fast and good at chess really fast because he's figured out that there's a method to turning on this light onto all the facts that lay before you, right? And once you see the way in one thing, you begin to see it in all things. Very powerful. And it rings true. It rings true. Anytime I start something new, you know, I rely on things. I rely on past experiences of starting other things brand new uh, that were completely unrelated. Right. You're going through the whole, you're going through the growth process all over again from being a child to being a mature adult at something. Well, and just like we talked about way in the beginning. You're going from being the, the seed in the soil to breaking through and then 
climbing towards the light and then bearing fruit. It's the same thing. It's all the same. Yeah. Yeah. Like we talked about in the very, very beginning, right? It's like, that's the abstract truth, right? You're extracting. What is the, what, what is, what is to be a beginner, right? What, how, what is to learn? That's an abstract truth. That's not like a physical thing. And so, yeah, once you know that you can, you can learn anything. We are all wise. The difference between persons is not in wisdom, but in art. This is what I wanted to get to. Okay. The difference between persons is not in wisdom, but in art. I knew in an academical club, a person who always deferred to me, who seeing my whim for writing, fancied that my experiences had somewhat superior. Whilst I saw that his experience were as good as mine, give them to me and I would make the same use of them. All right, this resonated with me. So this is what I was talking about at the beginning of the podcast. One of the most common responses I've gotten to things that I've shared online is that you were able to put into words something that I knew already but couldn't explain. The difference between persons is not wisdom but art. We all have the same tools and the same information to paint with. It's the artistic side of it that puts things together. Yes. Right? So why, when someone says something that resonates to you, it's because you knew it already. Mm -hmm. You just couldn't put it together. You couldn't paint it. You couldn't put it into words. So it's not the information that's stopping us from all being wise. It's the ability to compile the information and package it. Yes. In a way that's understandable. Yep. Yep. And to and to creatively connect that information to things we've learned in the past as well, and make new things. There's that. There's that sort of creative yes. boundary breaking angle. To be able to yeah to be able to connect dots or 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 what what are most innovations right? Most great ideas are a combination of multiple ideas. Yep. Exactly, and that's why too you know. I'm an IQ realist, but I'm also noticing that there's huge limits to pure you know, to purely going off of IQ with people, because there's some people with very high on paper IQs who are so rigid in their beliefs when it comes to things like politics or things like society or um, science. You know, they're so rigid they will not leave their paradigm regardless because they've they've uh, it's almost like they've psyoped themselves with their own intelligence that they're that they're right, and so they don't they're not connect they're not they're not open to new information they're not open to getting their paradigm broken. It's it's pretty fascinating. Yeah, it's like they say, in a left brain world, which we live in, we live in a predominantly left brain world where it's all about logic and science and order. You contemplate the parts but you lose sight of the whole hmm. that's what happens we start worshiping the parts and we forget about the whole that's very interesting yeah it's like worshiping the institution versus like what does that introduce and represent in the whole of society right right it's like looking at like an engine and it's like you just focus on each separate part as opposed to understanding the whole thing you can't the, the person can't see that the whole thing is an engine Yes. I can only see the, sep the separate parts of the engine, right? And it's that, and this is why people don't, those people can be really intelligent and not say profound things because what? They have the left brain logic, but they're missing what? The right brain art mm -hmm. and creativity and contemplation to piece it all together and weave it all together into something that holistic. He actually talks about this later on. All right. Back to Emerson. He held the old, he held the old, he holds the new. He's gone on talking about this guy that he says, if you gave me your experiences, I would make some use of them. He said, he held the old, he holds the new. But I had the habit of tacking together the old and the new, hmm. which he did not use to exercise. This may hold in the, the great examples. Perhaps if we should meet Shakespeare, we should not be conscious of any steep inferiority, no, but of a great equality. Only that he possessed a strange skill of using, of classifying his facts in ways that we lacked. 
That's all it is. We all have access to it. It's just how you put it together. Exactly. And I, th- I this isn't his, isn't his point, but it's another thing worth considering too for people that might be listening to this and might be like in disbelief, is that, you know, when you meet somebody really intelligent in one field, that's not a sign that you need to do that field, right? Like you're you 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 you're probably not the next Shakespeare. You probably have no care for playwriting and poetry personally, but you might be really, really, really good at something else. In fact, I can guarantee that you're really, really good at something else, you know? And so figure out what that is and apply those principles to, to that thing instead. Yeah. And the more things you get good at, the more easier, the easier it is to get good at things. That's why I say train everything. (laughs) Right. Like that's all this is. It's like, Train everything because you'll start to see the way in all things and you'll start to be able to possess this skill of classifying facts in ways that others lack and putting everything together because you go through those principles. We talked about the seven principles in the beginning. You go through them in everything that you experience. So when you can see them in one thing, you again, it's like we said before, once you see it, you can't unsee it. And then it just starts transferring. Here's a segment I wanted to read. It said, I don't really have much of a <clears throat> to say about it, but I just liked it. If you gather apples in the sunshine or make hay or hoe corn and then retire within doors and shut your eyes and press them with your hand, you shall still see apples hanging in the bright light with bows and leaves there too, or the tasseled grass or the corn flags. And this is for five or six hours afterwards. There lie the impressions on the relative organ. Though you knew it not, so lies the whole series of natural images with which your life has made you acquainted in your memory. Though you know it not, and a thrill of passion flashes light on their dark chamber, and the active power seizes instantly the fit image as the word of its momentary thought. He's just talking about how it's interesting, like how the image you see, images you see stay in your mind. There's an after image there. And he's talking about that, how that kind of plays into memory. But that is really profound because I, I was just thinking about it. It's like when you do something throughout the day, like you just spend your day, you can still see those images in your mind later on. Like they're impressed upon you in some way. I just like that passage. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Like, I don't really have much to expound on it, but I just thought it was really cool because I, I never really thought about that. I was like, oh, wow. Like, you know what? Like, I can kind of see in my mind what happened in the past few hours. Yeah. That I just, just doesn't go away. Now, maybe people who can't contemplate the apple or whatever <laughs> can't, can't see that, but I can see it. I, I don't think they're, I don't think those people and people who uh, haven't had breakfast this morning. Or, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I just, I just, I think that I don't think those people are people. <laughs> <laughs> I just think how the the paragraph's so cozy, dude. Like you gather apples in the sunshine, you make hay, or ho- like it just puts you on like a New England farm in the eighteen hundreds, right? And you're just like working outside, picking honey crisp apples, right? All this stuff, just like this is high vibe, sober approved. Yes, sober approved. <laughs> Back to Emerson. But our wiser years still run back to the despised recollections of childhood. Oh, okay. All right. This is the part I want to talk about before. Okay. I'm just going to read this whole thing. There's always a part we wanted to talk about before that yeah. we could talk about. <laughs> yeah. All right. It is long ere we discover how rich we are. Our history, we are sure, is quite tame. We have nothing to write, nothing to infer. But our wiser years still run back to the despised recollections of childhood. And always we are fishing up some wonderful article out of that pond. Until, by and by, we begin to suspect that the biography of the one foolish person we know is, in reality, nothing less than the miniature paraphrase of the hundred volumes of the human history. So, first I want to say that that last part was really profound where he says 
every person we know is in reality nothing less than the miniature paraphrase of the hundred volumes of the of the universal history all humans are all of human history right like every lesson every fable every myth the hero's journey the iliad all these things are in every single person every story of defeat success heartbreak loss gain we all experience all of them in different ways to different degrees all of every man goes through well if you live like a full life or even if you don't we all go through all the stories of history the same patterns even though the exact events and happenings may be different it's all the same aesop's fables all the same mythological tales so that's one thing i want to point out about the end of that but what this made me remember, he says, our wiser years still run back to the despised recollections of childhood. And always we are fishing up some wonderful article out of that pond. Out of that pond is like our memory of our childhood, right? So one thing that I think is actually very important for people to do is to revisit their past. Yes. Travel old paths, visit old neighborhoods, old schools, old jobs. Oh, well, physically. That's interesting. Physically. I'm talking about physically visit there. Right? Like, I actually literally do this. So some of you may know, I grew up in England. I lived in England when I was through first grade through eighth grade. Right? That's where I grew up. For the past couple of years, at least once a year, I will literally fly back to where I grew up and do nothing but walk my old path to school. Go sit in the playgrounds I used to play at and as a child. Go visit old friends. Go walk around my old neighborhood. And I will literally go away. I will travel over to England. I just did it in March. And I'll just walk my, retrace my old footsteps. And there's insights there. I get transplanted back in time. I can feel what I felt years ago, 20 years ago. And I, I can pick up pieces of myself that I lost and learn about myself just by retracing my own footsteps. And I even do the same thing when in places in the US that I've lived. I go walk to the parks that I hung out at after school. I go drive by my old houses. I go visit the first house I was I ever lived in, even though I don't even remember it because I only lived there from the time that I was one to three years old. And I do all these things because that pond has wonderful articles that we can fish out of it, like Emerson said. And I even suggest, I will even go into another more spiritual level that people might call gobbledygook, but I don't think it is. I think you should visit where your ancestors lived. I gotta make if a trip can, over to. I gotta make a trip over to Syria and Germany. Yeah, you should. You should retrace the footsteps of your great grandfather and your great great grandfather and your great great grandmother. There's insights there. Insights to be had. I go through old photo albums of my grandmother and my grandfather to see what they were like, what formed them, because something that's in them is in me. And this is how you connect to deeper parts of yourself that you think are lost, but they're not. That's profound. Yeah. So this is something that I, I truly believe in. And that's a piece of advice that these, these are the really good piece of advice that I don't tweet out. Yeah. I, I gotta, say, I gotta get to my hometown this, this year. And yeah. Go, go retrace your own footsteps. T tell me you don't feel something. Some people now, sometimes you feel nostalgia, but sometimes that nostalgia brings back, memories that you didn't know that you had yeah and through them you see formations of yourself like remember we were talking in the beginning it's like we're formed by so many different things that we don't even know well it's like we'll go back to where you were formed hmm. go revisit it go go call up your old school teachers i bet you some of them are still there go talk to them see what they remember about you people have stories about you that you don't remember <laughs> 
Yeah, I, I, I'm connected with a couple of teachers still. I, 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 that's wholesome. It's a wholesome thing. You know, so, and then I had another quote here that I meant to say before, but I was like, what is every person but the unfolding of human history? Mm hmm. Yeah. We're all just a piece. We're all just a piece, but we're also all of history mm -hmm. and our experiences. His story. Right? It's, it's just the same repeated patterns over and over again. The same struggles, the same triumphs, the same emotion, the same loss, the same gain, the same obstacles. Like he was just talking about with the people in, in university, right? He's, he's, people in this era are having trouble with academics. They're thinking it subdues the mind and whatnot. Yeah. And yeah, it's the same thing, right? Like, just like re you read a book like Hagakure, where they talk about how the samurai are getting soft and they're like 10 times harder than anybody today, but they're complaining about manhood the same way people complain about it today's time. And obviously there's cycles to these things, right? Like, and you, you get caught in like the whole strong men create good times, right? Like there's cycles to it, but it's, again, it's the same repetitive cycle. Yep. It's not, it's not significant. It's the same thing. And through our own actions and experiences, we are on the hero's journey. We are in the Iliad. We are in Romeo and Juliet, right? Like, it's all happening with, within each of our lives in some way, shape, or form. And this is why these great tales speak to us and stand the test of time. This is why we still read Aesop's fables. Mm. And this is why myth and these fables and stories are so important and why taking them out of being taught to society is horrible because what they do is they operate in that right brain space where it's imagery and art to explain all the logical, mechanical bits and pieces that we're separating and observing. It's packaged in these stories artistically and creates powerful images and it has the same information, but in a more holistic sense. Stories and metaphor always stick deeper into the human mind than raw information or raw facts. Always. Always. So, yeah, I, who knows what that's done to society, like taking that out of our education. That's why the Bible is so powerful. Mm -hmm. It's the stories in it. Yeah. Yeah. The story is how we view our own life. And so it's the natural way of, of human conversation and communication. Like even the whole book itself, it starts in Genesis and ends in Revelation. It's the same thing that we're talking about starting in the soil and ending up with fruit. It's the same thing. It's all intertwined, all interconnected. All right, here's where he starts talking about genius. Let's see. Genius. I have highlighted here. To genius must always go two gifts, the thought and the publication. The first is revelation. He's talking about the thought. So the thought is the revelation. It's always a miracle, which no frequency of occurrence or incessant study can ever familiarize. And so he's talking with the spontaneity, right? The thought, the spark, the light turning on, the air drops. The first is revelation, always a miracle, which no frequency or occurrence or incessant study can ever familiarize, but which must always leave the inquirer stupid with wonder. How many people are just sitting around in this stupid amazement these days? Not enough, right? <laughs> it's like... He says, it is the advent of truth into the world, a form of thought now for the first time bursting into the universe, a child of the old eternal soul, a piece of genuine and immeasurable greatness. It seems for the time to inherit all that has yet existed. This is what I was talking about before. It, it, it's, it, everything we're learning is like it's all that's ever existed at the same time. And, so, and to dictate to the unborn. It mm. affects. Every thought of man 
and goes to every and goes to fashion every institution. But to make it available, it needs a vehicle or art which is to which is conveyed to men to be communicable. It must become picture or sensible object. We must learn the language of facts. The most wonderful inspirations die with their subject if he has no hand to paint them to the senses. The ray of light passes invisible through space, and only when it falls on an object is it seen. When the spiritual energy is directed on something outward, then it is a thought. There's a lot there. Yeah. The, <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, to, to, make it, to be communicable, it must become picture or sensible object. We must learn the language of facts. The most wonderful inspirations die with their subject if he has no hand to paint them to the senses. At the end of the day, that's how the idea propagates. It needs to be turned into something material and spread. And the internet has made it very easy to do that, right? Like, I bet a lot of your tweets have, you know, your, a lot of your tweets have been this process of of just spontaneous thought, like you said, of airdrop, and then you just write it out, and then th that just changes somebody's life completely because they read that. Right, and it's just, it's the art of putting it all together. That's all it is, and that's what I talked about at the very beginning of the podcast, where I was like, oh, I explained a skill that I've had and I used I didn't know what I was doing. Mm -hmm. All I've been doing is taking all the facts and information that we all know and putting it together artistically in a way that others can understand themselves. And that's, that's all it's about. And then, and then he even talks about making it a picture of sensible. We were just talking about imagery, right? Like it's the most powerful form. This is why memes are unstoppable. Yes, he says like, picture. I like he, he he says picture or sensible object. He doesn't say manuscript or whatever. He says picture, which I think is a very interesting choice of words. Yeah, like like if you want to red pill people in your life or like wake them up, arguing back and forth with them is probably a waste of time. Just send them memes. Yeah, because you know what meme means, or like where that word comes from. It's it's a. Uh... It's a thought transferred at scale. No, so you know what a meme is? Something that makes you go, me, me. Oh, wow. That's really funny. Right? Was that, was that, in, the, was that in the actual early definition? I'm pretty sure that's what it is. That's and funny. if it's not, then the it's just another word magic that just makes perfect sense. Where it's I've like, never, we say things that we don't even know. That's I've what memes never are. heard that. They make you go, me, me. That's my experience. That's what I know. That's my life. That's what I'm going through. That's all it is, right? So that's how it started. And it's like, that's why it's better to, and it's just an image. It's not words. It's not a manuscript. It's not Nietzsche. It's not any of this overly intellectualized BS. It's just a simple image. And the image explains an entire human experience. So what I want to influence people that like I care about, I don't argue with them. I just send them memes. Because they can't, the, the image encompasses all of the information that I want them to have anyways. And if it's funny, it's it gets along even better. That's why like a lot of the best plays that have happened in life, they have like humor in them. Right? Comedy is one of the best teaching methods. This is why one of the first things they censored was comedy, because for something to be funny, it has to be true. It has to be a meme. It has to make you go, me, me. That's why I got rid of on Benjamin first. <laughs> right? Because the jester is the one that exposes things. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, well, that's what he talked about. Like, if you can get somebody to laugh, you get them to agree with you, even subconsciously. You know, like, uh, like the armor breaks down. There's no turning back from from a genuine laugh at something. It's humbling. It is humbling because you, yeah, the wall comes down, and they have to realize, like, well, I laughed at that. Like, that was funny. 
there was something in there that resonated with me. It's it's humbling and it's awakening. This is why they're they're gonna stop you from being like they're trying to stop people from being able to post memes. Like you, they're trying to make it so you get in trouble for it. Yeah, it's too powerful. They they can use the all the Hollywood programming, all the algorithms they control, all the government influence. They can't beat the power of comedy or a powerful image. Yeah, they can't overcome it. They can spend all the billions of dollars they want. Yeah, one guy going, <laughs> it's kind of funny, spends five minutes making a meme, posts it, can destroy an entire media complex's narrative instantly. Right, this is why they have to censor people. They have to, or else you're going to you're going to completely deconstruct everything <laughs> through through humor and through imagerized, is that a word, imagerized, imagerized truth? Like, imagerized truth, that's... I, it might not be a word, it might not be a phrase, but it's a word and phrase now. Let's see. Imagized. See, that's the thing with language. It's it's all artificial, you know? So we can just right. make up words if we uh, want. This is, my, this is my art. If we understand, you know, if we understand the meaning of, lang- of, of the word, if we understand the meaning of what we're trying to convey, then the actual word doesn't matter. It's just code. So, imagized. Imagerized. That's Ima- imagerized. Imagerized. I'm gonna start using that just just to just yeah, piss Im- some people off. <laughs> imagerized truth. That's all it is. Okay, got a little excited there. Let's keep going. Back to the essay. As all men have some access to primary truth, so all have some art or power of communication in their head, but only in the artist does it descend into the hand. Very true. Yeah, the artist is compelled to, to to put that into reality, whereas others might have the same thoughts and the same visions, but they're just that they're not compelled the same way. You are the artist. We're, we're all the artists. If you choose to be, mm-hmm. if you don't choose to be, if you don't exercise it, if you don't paint, you're not going to be a painter. If you don't sculpt, you're not going to be a sculptor. Right? And, like, actually, a lot of people today are blowing up for being sculptors. What are they sculpting? They're sculptors of men. That is not to get into the conversation of whether good or bad, but that's what Andrew Tate does. What does he do? He sculpts people. Sculpts men to make money, get Mm. girls, learn how to protect yourself form a brotherhood, right? Those are his four principles or whatever. But that's what people who are trying to build people up are. They're sculptors. And when you're revealing something, I guess you'd be, where you're, where you're, where you're explaining something, exposing something, I guess you'd be a painter. You're creating an image of it, right? 100%. Well, what would a singer do or a poet? <laughs> Interesting. We'll have to come back to that one day. The thought of genius is spontaneous, but the power of picture or expression in the most enriched and flowing nature implies a mixture of will, a certain control over the spontaneous states, without which no production is possible. It is a conversion of all nature into the rhetoric of thought under the eye of judgment with the strenuous exercise of choice. Who is the first drawing master? Without instruction, we know very well the ideal of the human form. A child knows if an arm or a leg be distorted in a picture, if the attitude be natural or grand or mean, though he has never received any instruction in drawing or heard any conversation on the subject, nor can himself draw with correctness a single feature. A good form strikes all eyes pleasantly long before they have any science on the subject. And a beautiful face sets 20 hearts in palpitation prior to all consideration of the the mechanical proportions of the features and head. That's incredible. There's some knowing truth in all of us. And we know when we see something is right and when something's wrong. 
It's an implicit truth, man. We just know. It's just, we just know, right? How do you know? Gnosis. It came to me in a dream. <laughs> All of these things are valid. This reminds me of, um, this is funny. This reminds me of, of um, you know, sometimes there's like in sports, there's coaches who they haven't played a single game of the sport their entire life, but they're insanely good coaches. And the reason is because they just, they under like, obviously they're, highly intelligent stuff like that but they understand this principle they understand that you can know something and you can tell where something is wrong and you can kind of see the bigger picture you don't have to be the guy that knows how to like do the actual technical skill you can just tell if something is off yeah and sometimes it works this way inversely for things like you can learn how to be a rich man by observing the habits of a poor man exactly yeah yeah, you can. You can learn how to be a healthy person by observing the habits of an unhealthy person. Just got to invert it. Flip it. But that is one of the worst things in today's world. It's like, what? that's how you know you live in a left brain world too, is like, you can make the most valid point in the world and someone be like, what's your degree? <laughs> what's your degree in? It's like people use this logic and it blinds them from real truth all the time and it's like no i'm just the child that knows whether an arm or a leg is distorted by a picture and i don't even know how to draw i could just tell if it looks like a person or not i know what beauty is that's why it's so hard for that's why one of the things that started waking people up was them promoting ugliness as beauty yep the reverse effect, because everybody knows what beauty is Mm-hmm. Yeah. You can't you can't lie to us. Yeah, it's something exactly. primal and instinctual. Like even kids know who's beautiful and who isn't. Like I knew which one of my aunts was the prettiest when I was growing up. Right? Like I could tell you know from a young age when someone's beautiful or ugly. So and yeah, maybe there's some taste involved or whatever, but there's some beauty that's undeniable. Right. So when they try to pass off things that are just obvious to a child as a fact, it just, they actually undo their control. They actually break the spell they have over people <laughs> unknowingly. I have so much highlighted here. This part I'm just going to read because I liked it. We may owe to the dream some light on the fountain of this skill. For as soon as we let our will go and let the unconscious states ensue, see what cunning draughtsmen we are. We entertain ourselves with wonderful forms of men, of women, of animals, of gardens, of woods, and of monsters. And the mystic pencil wherewith we then draw has no awkwardness or inexperience, no meagerness or poverty. It can design well and group well. Its composition is full of art, its colors are well laid on, and the whole canvas which it paints is lifelike and apt to touch us with terror, with tenderness, with desire, and with grief. He's talking about in our dreams, we're the perfect artists and painters. Mm -hmm. We can create all forms that you can imagine and in ways you can't even imagine them. Yeah, dream logic, the imagination, all these things. That, yeah, they're not. It's not bound to any sort of material constraints. It is pure expression. The mystic pencil with which we draw has no awkwardness or inexperience, no That's meagerness true. or poverty. It can design well and group well. Its composition is full of arts. Its colors are well laid on, and the whole canvas which it paints is lifelike an app that touches with terror, with tenderness, with desire, and with grief. The conditions essential to a constructive mind do not appear to be so often combined, but that a good sentence or verse remains fresh and memorable for a long time. Yet when we write with ease and come out into the free air of thought, we seem to be assured that nothing is easier than to continue this communication at pleasure. 
this is kind of what we talked about before we started recording. Mm-hmm. So when we when we write with ease and come out into the free air of thought, we seem to be assured that nothing is easier than, than to continue this communication. It, it really is. It really is. Writing when you're not in writing, writing it not in this state is one of the like writing something good is one of the hardest things ever. But writing when you're inspired and you have this open vessel flow, it is effortless. It's not even just writing; it's yeah communication. It can be a day at jujitsu mm-hmm. where you're just in a flow. It's that flow state. And when you get into that state, everything's easier. That task is just easier to do. And sometimes other tasks are easier to do. Because you're in that peak state where you're out in the free air of thought. And nothing's easier than than to continue on that energetic path that you're on. There are many competent judges of the best book and few writers of the best books. But some of the conditions of intellectual construction are a rare occurrence. The intellect is a whole and demands integrity in every work. This is resisted equally by a man's devotion to a single thought and by his ambition to combine too many. Does he mean like an obsession over a single paradigm? So like resisted equally by so like for example, like oh I, I must believe in this economic system and I must force every thought to can to bend to this economic system instead of trying to tr- discuss with truth and thinking, where can this be improved? Or am I totally wrong? No, I think that that's what you're saying. That's what he's saying. Yeah. Like, and his ambition to combine too many, right? Like trying to like, yeah, yeah it's try, like, trying to you do get everything. Too single-minded, you get too single-minded or you get too scattered, right? Yeah, exactly. Right. And that's why I say it's, this ain't logic. Maybe this is art. It's different. Totally different. You know, the intellect as a whole. It's the left brain and the right brain. It's all of it together. The laws of art are are different than the laws of than the laws of like logic. <laughs> right. There there is a logic to art, but the um the inception of order and totally chaos different. and cha- and chaos and order. Yeah. I, I'm actually gonna talk about that later on. Truth is our element of life. Yet if a man fasten his attention on a single aspect of truth and apply himself to that alone for a long time, the truth becomes distorted and not itself, but falsehood. Oh, this is what I want to talk about. Mm -hmm. Okay. So this is something that everyone is susceptible to, even people on our side of the conscious spectrum, let's call it. Colty bro had a great tweet about this recently. He was like, these Huberman types and these like biohacker types, they all start off with really good intentions. But they're doing what Emerson said. They said, he says, if a man fastens his attention on a single aspect of truth and applies himself to that alone for a long time, the truth becomes distorted and not itself, but falsehood. This is what happens with all these on it types, Right? Like these psychedelic types, they do. They get so obsessed with like <laughs> these <love>. on it types. <laughs> yeah, no, it really is, bro. Like, there's there's some crossover between like them and like the base right wing because they're kind of woke on like health things, right? But like, they get caught caught up in this concept of love and accept everybody, and then <laughs> nothing's personal. You can bang my girlfriend. It's like, literally like, it's like, it's the, like the slippery slope from flipping kettlebells around once in a while to like letting other men bang your wife. Right. They just get focused <laughs> on these one aspects of truth and they follow it too so much that the truth becomes distorted 
and not itself. And now they're living in a falsehood. Now, now, um, other, other men are impregnating your wife, you know, and that, that really happened too with that, that Kyle Kingsbury dude. I don't even know what's going on, but I don't want, I don't even want to know. Oh yeah. I'll just get a quick rundown. This guy was like a base Chad MMA fighter. Yeah. Then he started like promoting pride stuff, which I don't know if he's gay or not. I actually, if you let somebody bang your wife, you're gay. But um, he is like Aubrey Marcus's right-hand man. They got into all this love and acceptance and no ownership over other people. And what's that? All this sex at dawn stuff where it's like, oh, people are polygamous. And then he let his wife have a live-in boyfriend with them while they have a son already, mind you. Oh, no. The live-in boyfriend comes in, knocks his wife up, has a kid with her and then breaks up with her. And now he's just raising like this other dude's kid. And this guy was like a MMA fighter. Like he fought in the UFC. That's just. <laughs> this, this is exactly what, and, and like I was saying, what Colty bro was talking about, like all these people, they start off with good intentions. Like, Oh, like extending your life. So like, it starts off as I want to eat healthy so I can be, active and mobile in my old age and maybe get a couple years on this earth like that sounds great right like you don't want to die at an unnecessarily young age right but then it's like progresses into like okay biohacking now i'm wearing all these devices and following these strict schedules okay and then now you got this guy he's like injecting his son's blood inside of him like yeah no when you stick to these truths too much they become distorted and, and it becomes a falsehood Right, because yeah, like truth is a uh, truth is in all things, and when you stop looking for the truth in all things, I think it just, I think it, it kind of just breaks you, because that's not, that's not natural. We're supposed to have multiple points of stimulation and multiple focuses, and you know, even farmers, you have different types of crops, you have like different things to do, right? It's not just like you're not just like plowing the field. You have a hundred other tasks to attend to throughout the whole year and you have the changing seasons and whatnot. So it's a very unnatural way uh, to live. Yeah. Life requires some flexibility, you know, like you can't take, and this is just another separate point, but it's kind of connected. Like you can't take something and make it your whole personality. Like you're not the first nigga to ever eat steak. Like calm down. You don't have to become steak bro. You know what I mean? Like, don't let – you're not the first person to ever go to the gym. Has you steak know? once, gets five pounds of muscle. It's like, oh, this is the truth. You're not eating enough steak. It's like, yeah, and it's like, who's that one guy? And it's like, he was pretty cool at first, like the Sean Baker guy or whatever. But now, like, his life has devolved to, like, dunking on videos of vegan people by eating steak or something. It's, like, just corny, bro. Like, yeah. grow up. Like, some of this stuff is just, like, it's not that deep. You know, like, I, I, I've actually had, like, a funny thing that I say. It's, like, I've said things in passing that people have made whole brands of themselves off of. <laughs> like, I just I take, have. I swear to God, I really have. And it's, like, I just take the, the fact, I observe it, and I synthesize it and add it to my life, and I move on to the next thing. Like, you can't be getting stuck on these one dogmatic things. And these people are like, oh, that's my brand now. It's like, yeah, it's your whole entire life now. Now you're just as much of an NPC as like the dude sitting in the office because yeah. you only have one person. You're you're yeah. you're just like the the girl that's like, my personality is I like dogs. Yeah. and Netflix. <laughs> exactly. You're well, the same exact it, thing. I think it's you know what he's talking about here. I think it could, it could be even worse now. Because of the branding element, because now you have a financial incentive to keep to, to, to continue that falsehood, even if it doesn't work, you have a you have an incentive to keep going with it. So I think, yeah, I think that's going to keep it's, it. You know, he says even later with regarding something else, it is insipid insanity, right? Like that is what it is. Yeah, this is why I train everything, bro. I swear it's the greatest two word philosophy. 
Right here, right? Like literally, literally, literally the next line. How wearisome the grammarian, the phrenologist, the political or religious fanatic, or indeed any possessed mortal whose balance is lost by the exaggeration of a single topic. It is insepid insanity. It's like, there you yep, go, buddy. I have this highlight. Every thought is a prison also. I cannot see what you see because I am caught up by a strong wind and blow so far in one direction that I am out of the loop of your horizon. So, yeah, you guys got to be... Well, we all have to be flexible in, in thought. And it's just like when people talk about, like when I talk about like raising kids with people, people are like, oh, you're not going to be able to stop your kids from wanting to do eat chocolate chip cookies or whatever. And it's like, yeah, but I'm not an idiot. I'm not just going to tell my kid they can't have chocolate chip cookies. I would just make chocolate chip cookies in a healthy way and yeah. make it a reward for something. Right. Yeah. Like I'm not going to ban, I won't have a TV in my house. But I'll like let my kids watch Troy or something like constructive. You know what I mean? Like, or The Last Samurai or something that's going to build something. And I'm like, it's stupid. Yeah. People who just can find their kids and don't expose them to anything and try to keep everything away from them, they're going to fail. But there's alternatives on this stuff. It's about flexibility. 100%. All right. Back to the essay. The world refuses to be analyzed by addition of subtraction. When we are young, we spend much time and pains in filling our notebooks with all definitions of religion, love, poetry, politics, art, in the hope that in the course of a few years, we shall have condensed into our encyclopedia the net value of all the theories at which the world has yet arrived. But year after year, our tables get no completeness. And at last, we discover that our curve is a parabola whose arcs will never meet. Neither by detachment, neither by aggregation, is the integrity of the intellect transmitted to its works, but by a vigilance which brings the intellect in its greatness and best state to operate every moment. It must have the same wholeness which nature has. Although no diligence can rebuild the universe in a model, by the best accumulation or disposed disposition of details, yet does the world reappear in miniature in every event, so that all the laws of nature may be read in the smallest fact. Mm. That was an echo of what we talked about earlier regarding the looking at your own life. Yeah, and how each person is the unfolding of human history. Like, it's all... Yeah. Guys, if you're not getting it now, everything is everything <laughs> at once, ever, yeah. ever. <laughs> yes. It's all happening at the same time in us and outside of us. There's there's genesis, there's birth and death inside of us at all times. There's things falling into order and things falling into chaos at all times. And it's the same that's happening here on the earth as it's happening, happening in our bodies on a cellular level as is happening in the stars above on a galactic level. It's all going on at once. And he's just saying like the, the intellect, it's like it has to have the same wholeness that nature has. With no diligence can you rebuild the model of the universe. Not with any accumulation of details, but the world reappears in miniature in every event. And all laws of nature may be read in the smallest fact. And this is what I was talking about again. When you live in a left brain world, the focus is on the parts and you lose the contemplation of the whole. We have the logic, but we don't have the art to put it together. And it's like you need both, right? And it's like the left brain is like order, right? Like the left, we'll call the left side order. And we'll call the right side chaos. But there's, even though that left side is order, there's like a chaotic, crazy element to extreme order. Like think about like an autistic kid, like arranging, rearranging things on the shelves in a store. Mm -hmm. Like that's order, but it's crazy. Yeah. And then chaos has order too. Like chaos is like being the ocean surfing the wave for surfing the waves. You don't know which waves are going to come when. You're fine. They break in different directions, but like you're using that creative side to bring some order into the chaos. So the chaos is manageable. And it's like, you need both sides, right? So 
I, I thought that was pretty interesting. We are, we are stung by the desire for new thought, but when we, rec when we receive a new thought, it is only the old thought with a new face. And though we make it our own, we instantly crave another. We are not really enriched. For the truth was in us before it was reflected to us from natural objects. And the profound genius will cast the likeness of all creatures into every product of his wit. I like that part right there. The truth was in us before it was reflected to us from natural objects, right? There's that constant circular pattern, right? We we get we get ideas and then the we see we see them play out in the world around us and then those forge further ideas in the subconscious and then it's just this constant loop and that's why getting out into nature and to and experiencing things is just so important versus just being you know an email monkey God offers to every mind its choice between truth and repose. Repose is like rest or tranquility. Take what you please. You can never have both. Isn't between this isn't this wait, isn't this literally like comforting lie and uh, hard truth? What we just talked about earlier. <laughs> yes. Exactly. <laughs> so yeah. The funny thing is, there's been a few moments here. Where you you have to understand, I don't have this memorized, right? Yeah, me either. And I'm and I'm drawing new conclusions to some of these things as I'm like reading over them again and reading some of my notes on them. And there's been multiple moments while reading this essay that I've read something in a previous paragraph, had a complete um, spiel and insight on it. And then he says the same exact thing in the next paragraph. And I didn't know it was there because I, like I said, I don't have this memorized. So it's, it's pretty funny that we're like almost on the same train of thought as him. Like we're almost in, in some instances, I've noticed that I, I'm reading something that he said. And like my response to it is, is basically predicting the next thing that he says. Yes, that happens so often with us. Right, so I, I just think that's awesome. That means we're we're vibing hot. So, God offers to every mind its choice between truth and repose. Take what you please. You can never have both. Between these, as a pendulum, man oscillates. He in whom the love of repose predominates will accept the first creed, the first philosophy, the first political party he meets. So he's like the person who likes to rest. He, he goes with the consensus. He'll right? just go with the first thing that's thrown at him, right? Yep. Most likely his father's. Most likely yeah. his father's. <laughs> he gets rest, commodity, and reputation. Yep. He gets he gets rest, so he's not troubled by his thoughts. Remember, he's talking about like the melancholiness, like people that are oscillating, right? Yes. And thinking, he's like, he gets rest from that commodity, and he gets reputation. What's that? A acceptance. And, you know, this is this is insanely interesting because I read this book recently called passionate marriage and it's all about um, basically the key point in the book. It's like a marriage counseling book, but it's the key point in the book is, is this, this uh, principle called differentiation and the best marriages are where people are individuated and they're differentiated. So they don't, they're not suffering from what's called emotional fusion where they just accept like, like he said, they, 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 they accept repose. They accept this sort of rest. They accept the status quo of how things are instead of pers each, each person in the, in the relationship pursuing their own individual truths and then coming back and being together and being able to have a much more intellectually stimulating and intimate relationship from that. And so when you, you know, if you're, if you're, if you're, well, my in girl, state of, if you're my in that girl, state of repose, right? Like, well, uh, but my main point is if you're just in that state of repose and you're not differentiating yourself and you're not um, like you're not individuating yourself and trying to like, ha like think, use your own brain for things, then you will just like, especially over time, many years, you will just end up living a life that is not yours. And like so many men that do that, so many men, like 30 years down the line, they're like, why am I in this job? Why am I with this woman? 
You know, like, why am I living here? Right. I agree. What I was going to say when you're talking about, like, uh, the man and woman searching for their own truth, right? I was going to say, my girl's truth is that I'm the truth. Oh, I bet, bro. All right. I bet with with yours, yeah. (laughs) All right. But, all right, so one, one thing I want to ask, it's a question I actually heard on listening to a Spaces this morning, where he says, you get the rest, you get commodity, and you get reputation, which is like acceptance. And someone asked a question in the Spaces today. They were like, would you have rather have a good reputation or high self-esteem? And I'd rather have high self-esteem. Same. I'd rather I'd rather feel good about myself and believe in myself. Yes. Even if that means sacrificing some other people believing in me. Yeah, 100%. 100%. Because, yeah, the only thing that, you know, when you lose your sense of self and you, when you lose your self respect, it's over. Like that, that is, that is that Tucker Carlson, it's over meme, like personified, <laughs> right? Like it, there's no coming. If you continuously, disrespect yourself even though you know it's not what you truly want and it's not the truth you will just die you know you'll die well before you pass yes a coward dies a thousand times a hero only once yes all right where was i all right he gets rescued by your reputation but he shuts the door of truth he in whom the love of truth predominates will keep himself aloof from all moorings and afloat he will abstain from dogma, dogmatism and recognize all the opposite negations between which, as walls, his being is swung. He submits to the inconvenience of suspense and imperfect opinion, but he is a candidate for truth as the other is not and respects the highest law of his being. That's incredible. He who abstains from the dogmatism, he who has the love of truth it'll keep him aloof from all moorings and it'll keep him afloat he won't get caught up in dogmatism and he'll recognize all the opposite negations inversion between which as walls he's being swung swung he'll recognize all the things that are trying to pull you one way and the other he submits to the inconvenience of suspense and imperfect opinion so you're when you're Submitting the truth, you're submitting to not knowing, which is pretty wild to think about because it's the opposite concepts, right? When you are willing to know, you have to be willing to not know. Yeah. Socrates, right there. Right? The only thing I know is that I know nothing. Like you're submitting to the the suspense of not knowing and you're submitting to imperfect opinion. You're allowing yourself the opportunity to be wrong about things. And that's why I just keep coming back to this idea of being a vessel, of being, if not like not being a retard and like, you know, not like not accepting anything and just being totally open. But what I mean is like being a vessel for the truth specifically and being totally open to receiving it at all times and totally ready to act on it when needed. Like not trying to insert your own ego or bias into it. And he says, by doing this, you respect the highest law of your being. Which this is literally the opposite of what we were just talking about. Where people self-respect. Don't... Exactly. Look at Ooh, that. Was... See, we literally just did. We just, we did, just we... did what we said, right? Yeah, we, <laughs> we predicted we was going to say. We don't have this memorized, right? Like. You could tell by our delivery, guys. Like we are literally just reading this and thinking of things on the fly. Like we're not, we don't have scripts here. Come on. <laughs> the book is our script. We are just pulling from it as needed. We're just we're just receiving the airdrops. That's it. Happy is the hearing man, unhappy the speaking man. That's me. I'm actually happier when I'm listening. I don't like talking. But this is this is fun. But in general, if you meet me in person, like most people tell you I really don't like talking. I'll talk when if you ask me the right questions, I'll have a lot to say. But happy is the hearing man, unhappy the speaking man. As it's long so as I true. Yeah. 
Like people who talk too much, man. Like, think of all the people on Twitter who spend eight hours a day just throwing random shit out into the void, right? Like, that's not you're not happy. <laughs> you're not happy. This is why I limit and, and take breaks. Uh, actually, this is gonna remind me of this in a second, but as long as I hear the truth, I am bathed by a beautiful element, and I'm not conscious of any limits to my nature. Fire. Straight fire. The suggestions and thousandfold that I hear and see, the waiters of the great deep have ingress and egress to the soul. But if I speak, I define, I can find, and am less. When Socrates speaks, Lysis and Menexenus are afflicted by no shame that they do not speak. You got to be happy to be a learner. Like, as fun as it is to teach people, it's just as not... It, it's just as much fun or maybe even more fun to be a student. Yeah. Like... When it's with a good master, a good teacher, it's yeah. so much fun. Some of my happiest moments in life are like listening to John Danaher explain jiu-jitsu techniques. <laughs> I'm just like blown away. Like I don't... I would... I don't want to say a goddamn word in those moments. Mm-hmm. I just want to listen. Mm-hmm. It's all I want to do. I just want to listen and learn. Yeah. This is some. This is a tangent, but I've been I've been thinking about this for a long time. That was in the moments where you understand what 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 fear of God means. Fear of God is not a fear of like getting struck by lightning or having a plague kill you and your family. It is a reverence to like absolute perfection and a reverence to the most good. And so when you're in these moments, you're like. The fear comes from being afraid of leaving that moment or, or doing something yourself that would screw it up and stop it from happening. Whether that's a, a, a master explaining something perfectly, like Dana, her teaching jujitsu, Dillashaw teaching wrestling, or you're doing work and you're just in this deep flow state and you're so grateful for everything. Like that's the fear of God. Yes. It's, it's not destruction. It's falling out of grace or submission. Exactly. Yeah, which is fall because you're falling out of appreciation, which is terrifying, right? And it's like because you know that something is so magnet, you don't want to screw up anything that's really good for you, right? Like when you know, like say you get a good opportunity, like a job that you've been wanting to land, like you don't want to fuck that up, right? Yep, you're grateful, and, yeah, because you're grateful because you're like, man, this person gave me the chance of a lifetime, right? That that's what it is. And I like where he says, if I speak, I define, I can find, and then less. I think we talked about this before, but in translating what's in the mind. Now, we talked about how you can take all these facts that you have and you can paint them in this picture that makes them digestible, not only to yourself, but to others, right? But at the same time, even with that, there's always something lost in translation. Mm-hmm. By speaking the thought ceases to be exactly what it was almost. It's almost like the best people at communicating are the ones that are able to transmit the thought most correctly, but usually there's something lost always Mm -hmm. because the thought is not just words. It's images. It's a feeling, it's emotions, it's experiences, right? Well, think, think of the game, uh, you know, think of the game telephone, right? Or like, the girl whispers in your ear or something and you go around like 10 times. And then by the end of it, it's like a completely different message. And like, that's kind of what happens when you talk, especially with social media, right? When you talk at scale and you're like, steak is really good. You should eat it. Somebody will get that. And they'll be like, steak is the best thing ever. Steak is God. And I need to make money around steak. It's like, (laughs) okay, that that, that was nothing. That was nothing like what you said. (laughs) Well, it's also like, when he says, I can find, and then less. Well, he's like, it's taking something from you. But when that, the thing about confine, it's like, there's no limits in the mind. Mm-hmm. Right? And it's like, when we bring it into this world, it all automatically becomes limited a little bit. So, that's just interesting. These are things that I'm going to think about later. All right. Let us be silent, for so are the gods. Silence is a solvent. 
that destroys personality and gives us leave to be great and universal. Love this is point. the yeah. That this is this is great. Let us be silent for for so are the gods. Silence is a solvent. And it gives us leave to be great and universal. I talk about how people have fast from like social media and from like television and movies and taking in information, but people need to fast from putting out information. Mm-hmm. Like even speaking, this is where like all the silent retreats come in and things like that, right? Like there's something beautiful that happens when you can't communicate what you think or what you feel right when you can't do it you can only communicate it to yourself within your mind and so you get a much clearer picture of everything and everything becomes more defined and if people want to talk about well this is actually part of my creative process is not sharing anything letting things simmer in my mind and that's what allows me to put these this information together is I don't speak. I don't get a thought and just automatically be, oh, I got to tweet that. No, I store it. I actually have like a little note app. I store all these little notes. I just think about it for a long time. I, I really think that's true. You know, it's there's never been a time in human history where somebody can have a thought and immediately, without any editing or contemplation, just throw it out in the world and, and, and then get immediate dopamine rushes for that. And I think there is a power to just, when you have an idea, write it down and just store it for a long time. And if, if you let it, if you spend some time away from like social media, like not, not communicating, one thing you realize is that all this information wells up inside you and then you get like reinvigorated to like share and bring out these insights that are going up in, inside you. But if you just let them out all the time you don't give them a chance to boil over and become something that is effective and and powerful you gotta let it build up you gotta retain (laughs) yes tweet retention tweet retention (laughs) jesus says leave father mother house and lands and follow me who leaves all receives more This is true intellectually as morally. Each new mind we approach seems to require an abdication of all our past and present possessions. Take thankfully and heartily all they can give. Exhaust them. Uh, He's talking about Kant and Hegel, some guy named Swedenborg. I I need to look up that last name. Take, Take thankfully... And heartily all they can give. Exhaust them, wrestle with them, down for that. Let them not go until their blessing be won. And after a short season, the dismay will be overpassed, the excess of influence withdrawn, and they will no longer be an alarming meteor, but one more bright star shining serenely in your heaven and blending its light with all your day. So that's a great point. He's like, take these authors and wrestle with them and don't let them go until their blessing be won and he's like after a short season the dismay will overpass and the ex- excess influence withdrawn and then no longer will be an alarming meteor but one more bright star shining serenely in your heaven so this is like what we say about not making things your god and your whole entire personality mm-hmm. right let these things in assess them and then process them and then get over it assimilate it don't become it right assimilate it as a part a part of you not all of you yes and then they're not just like some alarming meteor that's coming and just destroying and taking over everything but they're just a bright star in the sky shining serenely in your heaven and blending its light with all your day yeah It just gets added in. And this also goes to our point about you should just, you don't need to read a thousand books. Like you need to find like 50 good ones and just read those over and over again. Like if it's something like on a specific subject, that's different. Like if you need to learn about like mechanical engineering or something, you need to read specific books for it. But when it comes to 
information like this, you don't need a ton of philosophies, right? You just need to wrestle with the ones that you have and then get them to the point where it's like they're just, you've assimilated their, they, they've just added a piece to your paradigm. That's it. They don't become all of your being like steak, bro. But whilst he gives himself up unreservedly to that which draws him, because that is his own, he is to refuse himself to that which draws him not. Whatsoever fame and authority may attend it, because it is not his own. Entire self-reliance belongs to the intellect. So here we go. He's talking about self-reliance again. Yep. Right? He says, like, while you give yourself up with no reserve to things that draw you in, because that's something that is a part of you, something draws you, it's your own. You should refuse those that the things that do not draw you, no matter what fame and authority may attend it, because it's not your, it's not your own. Right? Like, so you should be drawn to the things. The things you're drawn to are things you should pursue because it's coming from you. You shouldn't just be drawn to the things because a famous person or authority told you that you should be drawn to it. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It has to, it has to align. It has to align with, with the truth. You know, screw everybody, screw everybody else, to be honest. It has to align with the truth. I think consensus can absolutely destroy great minds. A fear, a fear of a fear of overarching consensus and breaking, you know, a social paradigm could just destroy a mind completely. I agree. It's like the same as we were just saying earlier. You're just dying a bit on the inside, more and more, losing more and more of yourself. This is a this is a paraphrase, but he says. The soul must treat things in books and sovereign genius as itself also a sovereign. Here we go. I only have a couple more left. The Bacon, the Spinoza, the Hume, Schelling, Kant, or whosoever propounds to you a philosophy of the mind is only a more or less awkward translator of things in your consciousness, which you have also your way of seeing, perhaps of denominating. Say then, instead of too timidly pouring into his obscure sense that he has not succeeded in rendering back to you your consciousness, he has not succeeded, now let another try. If Plato cannot, perhaps Spinoza will. If Spinoza cannot, then perhaps Kant will. Anyhow, when at last it is done, you will find it no recondite, but a simple, natural, common state, which the writer restores to you. Yep. So he's like, if one person can't reach you, give another person a try. Yeah, exactly. So not every writer is going to resonate. And that's that's the way it is. It's totally fine. And now we're on to the last paragraph. I only have the last part highlighted. And it's literally the last sentence in this whole essay where he says, the angels are so enamored of the language that is spoken in heaven that they will not distort their lips with the hissing and unmusical dialects of men, but speak their own, whether there be anyone who understand it or not. That's just like one of the most beautiful things I've ever read in my entire life. Perfect way to end it right there. That was, um, yeah, this, this, is, this is a great essay. And I'm actually excited to read this again because it's it's even better than it was when I read it the last time this is going to be one of those things that I'm going to have to turn back to probably once a year at minimum I'm about to do it like once a week <laughs> once a week I want to get it down yeah I want to get to the point where I can just quote Emerson off the top of my head that has to be the that has to be the way that has to be the way for us all. So, guys, I would say we just read, the, you know, our bits to you. Please find this online, get it on Amazon or whatever. Go to an old bookstore and get a whole copy, you know, get a whole compendium of Emerson. And read this because 
we just told you our, our bits, you know, this is from our perspective, but you're probably going to find tons of lines and there's going to be tons of context that you will, will have amazing reactions to. Um, and that you'll find tons of interest and love and value in as well. Yeah. This should almost like motivate you to want to read it for yourself. Yeah. If you're and thinking shine like, your own light upon it, like, that's what most of this is about. Yeah. Like ideally, Ideally, guys, you see the episode drop in Spotify or whatever, and then you go and you read that thing, and then you click and you watch this. Like, do that first. Get, get your own perspective built first, and then come and, and enjoy it with us here. I think you'll um, you'll you'll get a you'll get a much broader and deeper angle on this than than otherwise. And I'm sure there's things in here I missed that another person would spot. Exactly. So you, you know, can so- actually do us a favor and help us out. If you go through these things and find things that we know we didn't notice or that you can add more clarity to. Do like, please do. That'd be great. That's what I want. That's I want me and the boys to sit around and think about thinking. You know? Like <laughs> that's fun that's, that's what we're here to do. And the boys sitting around the campfire thinking about thinking. Yeah. You know, so like take take the advice in here, you know. I, we, we will do our best to break as many things down for you as possible and give us our perspectives on it. But one of Emerson's most important lessons is you have to have the self-reliance. You have to do these things on your own and come to you. Don't, don't listen to like take knowledge from people, but don't listen to anyone. If you understand what I'm saying, like you need to be the leader of your own mind. You can take lessons from other people, but it should just be like he was saying, like j- just like Emerson was saying, hold on, I'm scrolling to it, where he's talking about not letting these people be like a meteor that smashes your whole being, but just letting them become a bright star in the sky that's just a part of the light of your day. Like that's what we should be as well for you. Like you, you still are that sovereign individual. You're still likely, if you're listening to this, a man yourself. So you you can learn from others, but you have it's a learning from others is just a part of you handling handling the own responsibility that you have to be a student in life. There you know? we go. And helping you get more clarity on, on who you are. There so, we go. Yeah, first one back for after a long time. I really enjoyed this. I'm excited to do the next one. I don't know what we're going to do it on yet. Maybe we'll do nature more. Well, I'm leaning towards finishing nature because we did the first half, but we got to hit that second half. We didn't do language, did we? We didn't do nature. language yet, no. We okay. We've only done nature, farming, and self-reliance. Well, I'm talking. I think there's a part in nature called language. Oh, gotcha. Yeah. And I don't know if we did that part. Did yet. we do that? I think oh, we only I... did the first part of nature. I think nature is going to take like a few podcasts. This is this is only eight pages, and this was let's see, two almost two and a half hours. So two and a half yeah. hours. You know, I think so. I think our first nature episode was like three hours or something. So yeah. So. <laughs> Maybe we'll do nature or maybe we'll do a, a shorter one to just get back in the groove of things and get back to thinking like Emerson. And um, then we'll do nature, but it's it's been awesome. And I actually learned a lot while reading this. Same here. And reciting this. Same here. All right, guys, we'll see you soon. And we will be back. We're not going to keep up this terrible schedule again of taking huge hiatuses. We're going to get back to this consistently. And, uh, yeah, we'll see you soon.